What if the secret to Ferrari's most disputed turbo engine wasn't fuel, but water? In 1983, the evolution toward Tipo 031 promised numbers that defied a 1.5-liter V6. Inside lay a cooling play that stabilized combustion under brutal boost, sparked whispers of illegality, and later fed a ban myth. Tonight, we separate myth from mechanism and tell the real story of Ferrari's Tipo 031. Why 031 existed? The post-1983 escalation, the Tipo 031 did not appear out of nowhere. It was the product of a compressed timeline in which Ferrari had to protect momentum while the competitive ground shifted beneath everyone. Two facts defined that shift. First, the turbo era had matured. Power was now the currency that compensated for aerodynamic compromises and rising minimum weights. Second, rivals were learning fast. Any advantage Ferrari had forged with its early V6 turbo work would evaporate unless Marinello moved decisively. Ferrari's answer was to treat 031 not as a clean sheet miracle, but as a hard edged refinement of a concept that already worked. The wide 120 degree V6 layout remained because it lowered the center of mass and freed space around the car's spine for cooling and packaging. The goal was straightforward extract more power, more often, for longer without surrendering drivability. That target demanded three parallel tracks, sharper internal hardware, more disciplined mixture control, and smarter thermal management. Only then could Ferrari translate peak numbers into Sunday points. Context matters. The competitive picture after 1983 looked unforgiving. BMW's single turbo four was making headlines on the dyno and slicing drag with compact cooling packages. Renault had doubled down on its own V6 turbo, and its development rate punished the complacent. McLaren, meanwhile, was preparing a partnership that would bring German engineering continuity to a British chassis. Ferrari knew that a narrow victory would not be enough. It needed repeatable performance across circuits and climates. The only sustainable way forward was to make the engine predictable at the limit, not merely spectacular on a single lap. It is easy to treat 031 as a story about peak horsepower, but the real brief was stability. If you cannot keep combustion orderly, you spend Sunday afternoon chasing misfires, detonation, and component damage instead of chasing points. Ferrari's engineers faced a paradox every turbo builder wrestled with in that period. The cure for low-end response and top-end power, more boost, makes the disease of uncontrolled heat much worse. 031 is the chapter where Ferrari chose to solve the illness rather than prescribe more of the symptom. Additional context sharpened Ferrari's urgency. Championship arithmetic had turned unforgiving. To score, you had to finish. And to finish, you had to keep components alive under unprecedented cylinder pressures. Within that box, 031's mission was clear. Earn back lap time lost to changing aerodynamics by elevating specific output and widening the safe operating window, especially across varying ambient temperatures and fuel qualities. Ferrari also had to manage people and process. Leadership changes and differing philosophies inside the factory created cross currents that affected how quickly ideas moved from test bench to track. Yet the output kept climbing because the target was not abstract. Every competitor's stopwatch offered a weekly verdict. In that climate, the only durable strategy was to turn the engine from a spiky qualifier into a unit that could carry race distance with predictable behavior. The 031 program became the crucible for that transformation. Inside the beast, 1.5 liter 120 degree V6, twin Kuhn-Lecop Kausch control. At heart, 031 kept the compact displacement of the formula, 1,496 cubic centimeters. The architecture was a 120 degree V6 with twin turbochargers mounted to feed short intake tracts and to keep the exhaust side efficient. The geometry favored a low crankshaft line and better lateral packaging, which helped the car's weight distribution and eased cooling layout. Within that envelope, Ferrari pushed the rotating assembly, valve gear, and lubrication to operate comfortably under sustained boost, not just one qualifying lap. Twin kuhn lecop Kausch turbochargers supplied air with less delay than single turbo rivals, and when the whistle came in, 
The surge was linear enough that drivers could meter it with the throttle instead of bracing for a light switch. Mixture delivery and ignition timing were mapped to hold a stable burn even as manifold pressure changed corner to corner. The outcome on paper was simple to read. In qualifying trim, the family peaked around the mid to high 800 horsepower region, depending on conditions. In race trim, output settled significantly lower to preserve components and fuel. Chassis integration was where the concept matured. The 126C3 introduced Ferrari's full carbon monocoque approach. That step reclaimed stiffness for aero and tire consistency while taking mass out of the car. When the 126C4 arrived, the package around 031-1 chased cleaner exits and reliable cooling flow rather than exotic shapes that could not be manufactured consistently. By the time the 156-85 ran with 031-2, the conversation inside the garage was less about whether the engine could make headline power and more about how to keep that power inside a temperature and consumption window that an entire race demanded. Two factors tied chassis to engine more tightly than casual observers realized. First, cooling. The radiators and ducting that a high-output turbo V6 demanded created drag if they were sized conservatively and created DNFS if they were sized optimistically. Second, stiffness. Carbon monocoques allowed the suspension to do its work without the shell flexing, which kept tire temperatures in range and reduced the number of variables engineers chased from session to session. Those gains did not create headlines like horsepower did, but they decided races just as surely. Nothing in this section is glamorous. It is the unglamorous craft that separates a fast car from a fast lap. But the last piece, thermal order, was glamorous enough to become a legend because it used a substance that everyone understood and nobody trusted. Water. The water play. Mixture cooling. Without saying the quiet part. Ferrari's water strategy tackled the turbo era's defining bottleneck. Compressing air raises its temperature. Hot, thin charge invites detonation and erodes safety margins. The fix was to inject or blend a fine mist that absorbed heat as it evaporated, cooling the intake charge and flattening temperature spikes that appear during long pulls or repeated full-throttle transients. Cooler, denser charge supports more timing and more boost for the same knock threshold, which is why the method delivered power, reliability, and consistency at the same time. Three commodities that usually live in tension. Inside Marinello, the system lived as a practical tool, not a publicity line. Its role was to buy headroom where the V6 was most at risk, under high cylinder pressure, so that the map could be written for performance rather than survival. In that sense, the water play was less a trick and more a safety belt for aggressive tuning. It stabilized the mixture, protected hard parts, and made the engine behave the same way on lap 60 that it did on lap 6 when conditions were equal. The controversy was cultural not mechanical, because water already carried baggage. Rivals and reporters remembered ballast games and post-race top-ups. Different teams, different systems, different motives, but the same vocabulary. It was easy to blur an anti-detonant injection strategy with weight manipulation schemes that had burned reputations elsewhere. That confusion seeded the idea that water itself was illegal or that Ferrari's gain came from a forbidden additive rather than a legitimate cooling and combustion control practice. In the paddock, the system was often referred to by a nickname, an emulsion idea that mixed liquids and air in a way that kept the charge stable. However labeled, the science was boringly solid. Vaporizing water consumes a large amount of energy, a truth every turbo engineer learns early. The debate was never about physics, it was about optics. When journalists who were not in the calibration room heard water, they remembered a different circus entirely. Top-up tanks, the theater of post-race scrutineering, and the penalties that followed unrelated controversies. The record does not support that rumor. There was no single technical directive that arrived and declared water injection unlawful for Ferrari in that window. The real squeeze came from a cascade of changes that altered the arithmetic of racing. Tighter fuel limits, development directions that rewarded efficiency over peaks, and, later, constraints on the turbo formula itself. In that environment, the benefit-to-cost ratio of the water system shrank, not because the method became illegal overnight, but because the sport moved the goalposts toward economy and durability. 
Understanding why those seasons bent the way they did requires a glance at the rulebook downstream. Limits on fuel meant that teams had to plot races at a macro level rather than chase every lap time peak. You could run rich and aggressive, or you could finish, and the room to do both narrowed as the decade wore on. Later, caps on turbo pressure formalized that compromise, and finally, the removal of turbos ended the chapter altogether. The result was a creep, not a crash. Every step made aggressive thermal strategies pay a smaller dividend relative to their complexity. On the clock, 1984, 1985. Pace versus fragility. Look at the timeline and the outcomes feel almost contradictory. In 1983, the package that evolved toward 031 put real wins on the board, headlined drives that proved the concept under pressure. The engine family could take the fight to anyone in clean air and on medium to fast venues. Those results validated the basic architecture and the cooling strategy that underwrote it. They also suggested that the ceiling had not yet been hit. The appetite inside Ferrari was to push. 1984 showed both the promise and the price. The 126C4 with 031-1 could light up qualifying with power figures that captured headlines. On race day, however, the scoreboard exposed the margin where theory and practice diverged. A single victory covered a season otherwise haunted by incomplete Sundays. Some of that delta belonged to aerodynamics and tire operating windows, but enough belonged to the power unit's operating risk that nobody inside the team could ignore it. The envelope had been expanded. The bill sometimes arrived by lap 40. Then came 1985 and the 156-85 with 031-2. Early form suggested that the balance had finally been found. Michel Alboreto's opening run put him at the sharp end of the standings and made a driver's title a rational conversation. The engine's race trim output gave Ferrari straight-line authority, and the car could defend or attack without trick plays. And yet the season's second half turned that optimism inside out. Turbo failures multiplied. Engine-related DNFs cut points from a campaign that had started with momentum. A single image told the story, a Ferrari limping through fire, the cost of running so close to the edge visible to the grandstands. On the scorecard, the shape of the problem sharpened quickly. In 1983, the concept produced four wins for the team and delivered the Constructors' Championship. In 1984, the package achieved a single win at Zolder with Michel Alboreto, while the overall campaign placed Ferrari second among manufacturers. In 1985, the program delivered two victories, a sustained title push for Alboreto that eventually faded, and again second in the constructors' standings. Those numbers are not flukes. They track a complete story about a power unit family that could summon speed on command, but too often paid for it in component life. If you zoom out, the verdict is not dramatic, but it is decisive. 031 could make extravagant speed on demand and did so repeatedly. What it could not guarantee often enough was the uneventful afternoon that wins championships. The gap between being fast and being crowned was measured in reliability curves and stress cycles, not peak boost numbers. That is the lesson, 1984 and 1985, etched into Ferrari's own notebook. The arms race, Renault, BMW, Tag, Porsche versus 031. No engine exists without rivals. Understanding 031 requires reading it against the three philosophies that defined its neighborhood. Renault's EF Series V6 chose a similar path, twin turbo packaging, and crucially, its own take on water-assisted charge conditioning. The French program chased raw output hard enough to put terrifying numbers on the page, but it also lived with the bill that followed, fuel consumption and hard part fatigue that made consistency elusive. In that mirror, Ferrari could see both affirmation and warning. The method worked, but not without constant discipline. BMW's M12-13 four-cylinder took the opposite starting point. With one big turbo and a compact block, it offered slim cooling needs and helpful aero packaging. It also delivered the most notorious behavior of the era, long lag and then an explosive wall of torque that arrived like a switch. On open circuits, that trait was an asset. In tight layouts, it was a liability. Against that, 031 often looked more civil on corner exit, the dividend of a two-turbo layout and careful mapping. But BMW's single-lap fireworks remained a reality Ferrari had to cover. Then there was the benchmark of completeness, the TAG Porsche V6 that powered McLaren. 
It did not always make the highest number anyone whispered in the paddock, but it routinely converted Saturdays into Sundays with ruthless efficiency, strong power, controlled thirst, and a reliability profile that let the team plan races rather than improvise them. That is the comparison that stung, because it reframed the question from whose engine is fastest to whose package wins the season. On that measure, 031 often found itself a half-step short, not because it lacked genius, but because the calculus of points favored the least dramatic solution. Against the French, Ferrari's strength was drivability. Against BMW, Ferrari's edge was predictability. Against Tag Porsche, Ferrari's gap was durability per kilogram of fuel. That three-way comparison explains why the red cars could terrify opponents on Saturday, fight hard on Sunday, and still leave the circuit with fewer points than the stopwatch promised. In the mid-1980s, the title belonged to the program that could turn 16 weekends into a pattern of clean executions. McLaren did. Ferrari almost did. Banned by consequence. Here is the clean truth. Ferrari's Tipo 031 was not erased by a single rule that said, this device is forbidden. It was crowded out by a new logic of racing, an economy of fuel and component life that favored complete packages over absolute peaks. As the sport layered limits on consumption and, later, on boost, the relative return on an aggressive cooling strategy waned. The engine did not become unlawful, it became strategically expensive. That is why the legend persists. Banned is a tidy word that feels appropriate to an era of political fights and technical stunts. But the real ending is more interesting. Ferrari built a legal, brilliant, and brittle machine that proved a point about turbo physics before the rule book rewrote the incentives. It was banned by consequence, not by clause. And in that distinction lies its value today. The legacy is practical. Modern hybrid power units erase turbo lag with electric assistance and harvest energy that earlier packages simply turned into heat. The lesson that 031 hammered home, that thermal order, is the foundation of durable power now lives in every diagram of an ERS-equipped V6. Lessons also flowed into the road car side. Ferrari's later turbo models inherited the same balancing act between heat, response, and durability that 031 forced the factory to confront in real races. And perhaps that is the most ironic truth. The story of 031 is not just about what Ferrari lost, but about what the sport gained. It showed that genius without endurance cannot win a championship. It taught regulators that technology must be policed, not only by numbers, but by philosophy. And it left behind a reminder that sometimes the most feared machines are not those banned overnight, but those slowly outlived by progress. There is also a cultural legacy. Fans remember the flames from the exhausts, the sudden roar as Boost arrived, and the sight of Alboreto fighting a car that could either win or fail within the same weekend. Engineers remember broken pistons, fractured turbos, and long nights in the garage. Together, these memories turned 031 into a myth, not just an engine, but a symbol of how close Formula One came to burning itself in pursuit of speed. In that sense, the Typo 031 is a bridge. It links the wild, dangerous freedom of the turbo era with the disciplined precision of today's hybrid V6s. What was once a desperate experiment now looks like the first draft of ideas that dominate modern grids. History is full of ironies, but few are sharper than that. So here is the invitation. If this untangles the myth around Ferrari's so-called banned Tipo 031 and shows you what really decided races in that window, stay with us. We tell the engine stories that changed outcomes, sometimes by winning, sometimes by breaking, always by forcing the sport to evolve. Because in the end, history is not about who finished first, but about which machines dared to go too far.